Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Streche, and Yu Piscott as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back everyone to Cube's live coverage here in Amsterdam, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon Europe 2023. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, got Savannah Peterson, got a lot of hosts, a lot of guests, a lot of great panels. This one is about the role of data, AI, in DevOps, a lot of changes. We have Chanji Mohan, principal, at Sanjay, Mo, Sanjay Mo, principal, analyst. He's been tracking the data space, and we had the two great guests here, Matt Butcher and Justin Cormack, uh, on and back again, experts. Guys, data in DevOps, AI, future, ChatGPT is taking over the world. There's a company here that says they're the ChatGPT of DevOps. <laughs> Provision some Kubernetes. <laughs> I mean, automation is, in a way, data. Yeah, yeah it is, and configuration is data, and yep. generate, you know, Processing data and configuring data is kind of an you know it's an obvious target. We've seen quite a few things in the last few weeks with people taking that, looking at that space. Yeah, Sanjeev, I want to bring you in because you know you've been covering this space aggressively. Yeah. SuperCloud on our event, you got mm -hmm. the data fabric. Data will be a disrupting enabler in, in the world with AI. Machine learning's been around. I mean, everyone's like, we've been doing machine learning for a long time, which is true. AI is just a reflection of that next Correct. evolution. What's the AI impact in your mind? What, what do you guys think about this AI strategy for DevOps? It's like, it's not chat GPT, yeah. but it is intelligence, there's some automation there. What's the, what's the role of data right. in DevOps? So, so I will say, data and AI, there are two major shifts that I see going on. The first thing with data, something that's, that's very different from what we've been doing all this uh, time. We've been talking about big data forever now, for the last yeah. 10, 15 years, but it's turning out that the data that you need, like you mentioned configuration is data, uh, a lot of data that we need is not really that big sometimes. You know. Although your entire data set may be huge, but you really care about the most fresh, the freshest, uh, the most recent data. If that data is not too big, and I can train an AI model, and I can start doing some sort of like a search or analysis, I can do it on my, my laptop. Yeah, and also, yeah. We, we kind of forget that in the 15, 20 years of big data, yeah. Our computers have got much bigger, Correct. and so the size of the data I, often has got I smaller. I have seen I've seen benchmarks where the database has run at the same speed, if not faster, on an M1, M2 Apple Mac than a server. Mm -hmm. So if I yeah. can run, if the data size is not too big and the hardware is so advanced, you know, maybe I should do my compute uh, at, uh, in an engine that everybody has, which is a browser. Yeah, how cool is that? <laughs> it is. It is cool, and I think that you know we're seeing more, you know, more and more hardware for processing data hitting laptops and phones yep. because it's being driven by, you know, use cases like image processing on the f for your photos on the phone right. gets done in hardware, and then that hardware becomes available for Correct. Uh, for all sorts of applications. Right, and yeah. I, I think the the rise of real concern about privacy and personally identifying information is going to drive that forward because a lot of the things we care about knowing are also things that require data that maybe I don't want to send somewhere else to have it stored in perpetuity, right? right. And so to be able to take smaller, right. uh, well-defined sets of data and work on those locally, I think that's going to fill a big right. need for what we So let me throw want. something out at you guys, get your reaction, because I think Dave Vellante and I have been talking about the super cloud concept for about a year and a half, but it's more of, it become, it's become more multi-cloud, but, but, but yeah. let's pull that aside for a second. If the developer experience is more productive, mm -hmm. more compatible, run code anywhere, once run anywhere, uh, reusing code, you can almost imagine that's going to be better apps coming. So just assume that for a second. Yeah. With the cloud now in its uh, you know, teenage years, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. got more innovation that's not like your classic ISV. Yeah. Look at yeah. Snowflake and Databricks. They're building on top of the hyperscalers sure. without spending a dime of CapEx. Yeah. So no hardware required. Now you're running 
apps in the browser Correct. with Blossom, and you have data and AI coming, the next level applications that will come out are going to look completely different. Yeah. If you assume that, what does it look like? Yeah. And how does it work? What do you guys think? Yeah, and I think that's the thing that we have witnessed begin to unfold over the last five to seven years. Uh, we, you know, the cloud started as largely the simulation of the data center, which sort of started as the simulation of stacking a bunch of computers under your desk and plug them all together. And now that we have seen the, a, a generation of services evolve that were built for the cloud, uh, it's time to sort of start thinking, okay, well, now what's the next thing, right? How do we start building out from there? Um, AI and machine learning is a good example because now we're starting to understand when we, when we can rent lease somebody else's computing power and we can uh, store vast amounts of data in there, we can build things very differently than when we have to pay for the hardware ourselves. And then we have other things where, we, yeah. you know, we, yeah. then we start saying, well, wait, some of this we have to move back closer yeah. to the user. And that means we have to rethink a lot of the architecture that I think we're building. I, I think it's been really interesting, you know, in the development of, you know, it's been it's a decade of containers this year um, since Docker launched. And I remember, you know, the, a lot of the questions early on were like, oh, are people going to run a database in a container? Uh -huh. And then it turned out that actually suddenly, like, the question, like, that wasn't, the important question, the question was like, oh, I'm moving all my databases to a cloud provider because yeah. I want to, I don't want to run a database at all because yeah. there's no upside, all that could happen is I could lose my data and there's, <laughs> you know, there's just downside. <laughs> and now we're, uh, we're seeing a kind of third phase, which I think is the, the really interesting thing for this conversation is an explosion of new tools around data and new ways of doing things. You know, we're seeing like uh, SQLite and DuckDB for local data processing, we're yep. seeing like, People thinking about, you know, we're seeing cockroach and you know, kind of new databases that are just dis distributed from the start. We're seeing a huge amount of innovation in the data space. We're seeing almost, you know, a vast majority of apps have some data, you know, caring yeah. about data. They're mm -hmm. not like if you look at the 12-factor app thing from mm -hmm. the beginning of containers, <laughs> the one about data is the one that doesn't really apply anymore <laughs> because, like, never store data anywhere near your application doesn't make sense with a application is all about data and you want to do data processing. Uh, yeah. All the other 11 factors still look kind of okay, but that that's, you know, those data architectures have, have made those two jumps, one to the cloud and one to, oh okay, we're right, data's so important, we're going to have to think about this yeah. again yeah. now. It's a next gen conversation, what yeah. you're yeah. having. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, saw the, I see two super interesting trends, uh, things that are happening from the front end and the back end. So the front end is how data consumers are uh, getting the data they want to do the business decisions. And uh, today we spend a lot of time creating these reports and dashboards and something is never right. You know, you always need that extra piece of information, but with the AI coming into the picture now, what if I can ask, I'm a business user and IT doesn't, anticipate what uh, my needs are. Yeah. What if I can ask a question mm -hmm. on a model that's trained on my institutional data? So reports, dashboards, apps, I think in a few years they'll be gone. We'll have this uh, interactive uh, Q&A kind of a thing. That's at the front end. Now at the back end, something even more interesting is happening. The, you know how we kind of change the whole application space with microservices? I think that's coming to the data, in my opinion. In what way? So it's called uh, data products. And this year at the Cube, I mentioned that I see data products, which is a, a sort of a self-contained, tangible uh, piece of code and data together. Yeah. So mm -hmm. now a data product is like it's an API access to some uh, pieces of data so that becomes like a microservice. So to your point, Justin, that is how we are going to co-locate data and apps together. Who consumes so the product, the developer or the application? Uh, so it's a, it could be any data consumer. It could even be a DevOps engineer. A DevOps engineer wants to configure a system or wants to somehow monitor or test it. So instead of going directly to the database and writing a SQL statement, mm -hmm. they, they go to a data product. 
or a data product could be for a business user, like a supply chain for a retailer. So, what do you guys or, think or it that? could feed, I mean, that's the thing, as well as like, there's data products for people to look at, as you say, but there's also right. data yeah. products to feed back into, into systems themselves, so it's like, a product that optimizes your pricing mm -hmm. is, a, is a data product, but Correct. it doesn't feed back to a person who changes the price. It changes the price yes. for you and optimizes right. your pricing right. directly right. because you, you want to have that level of control and feedback built straight. You got observability, he's got data. Yeah. That's going to change with AI. Yeah. Board code's yeah. going to come in. I think machine learning here is the interesting new variable in this equation, right? Correct. I think yeah. for a long time, going straight to one of the points you made, right? When we were thinking about how do I, how do I organize my data, yeah. and then how do I query my data? Correct. Organization was all about formatting everything in the right. You know, we're breaking all the pieces apart, and we're putting each one in its little box, and we're going to shove it into a database, and then we're going to index it, and we're going to. But it was all very uh, oriented around the data types and and the 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 coder's ability to structure that data into little chunks that the computer understood, right? right. Then SQL was all about saying, and here's a language that I as a human can Correct. learn to try and make some sense out of the data in there. Right. Well, the cool thing about where ML is going is that both pieces of that equation are starting to look different, right? We've, we've learned to be able to feed data and the model into the model and have it figure out what the relationships yeah. are and then the query language becomes Chat, right? That's uh, the prompt. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah, is exactly language. Language. this is what yeah, I uh, wanted to Fred, get yeah. to. Thanks, yeah. thanks for bringing that up. That's exactly the point. I couldn't figure it out, but you just said it. Data on data. So organizing data was a decision not made by developers. That's a fact. Yes. Right, correct. Database correct. people. Yeah. Infrastructure people. Oh, we're storage and storage. What's the, how do you flip that script? What's in it for the developer? How does a developer develop with data? And then how do you organize the data if on behalf of the developer productivity? Because this prompting is showing us that data is interacting with data. That's like code. Yeah, it is like code. And yeah. you have code to start code. doing code like things with it. I mean, like, there's, you know, there's very different flows involved once you've got data. You have to start, you know, you're building models and you're testing them and you're refining them and, and you're, you know, that there's a there's a whole separate set of processes that look like what you do with code, but they're kind of also different in a yeah. sense yeah. as well. But you're, you know, you've got to be, you, you've got to think more like a scientist about like, you know, has the, is the world still the world it was when I built my model last week? Yeah. Is it, or is it, has something had changed there's, there's, and this is no longer working? There's more cars and more colors. There's more yeah. cars and more colors. Yeah. Yeah. But this yeah, is but happening right now. This is new. Yeah. This is a new yeah. phenomenon. We're, we're living through yet another one of those change moments. And to, I, I mean, that's the, the model. We've always kind of had the notion of model, I think, but we were very stringent about it. I think yeah. of a database, you know, uh, the DDL for a database is a model, but it's primitive and it's... it's and it's very slow moving. It yeah. doesn't change, you don't change yeah. it very often yeah. because it's and hard. So there's, yeah. you, you're turning all the knobs and dials to tweak it. Now, with machine learning, we have to build models and then trust that yeah. the model Object is store unstructured database is growing up into a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. right? I mean, that's what was and, happening here. Correct. And this, that was Justin's point, really, yeah. is that if if we lose, we, we like the tight grain yeah. control, the fine grain control over what the model looked like, but now we're starting to see the power yeah. of using an, a, an ML and, model. And, and this is the challenge the, I'm- The trust I'm, is the issue we yeah, don't have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I, what I mean by experiments and like, does is this working for me now? And does it, like you, you no longer have the, I wrote this, I understand every line of code in this. It's like, I, Fed this this data and it told me this was the answer today and I <laughs> yeah. want to I want to be very sure that the kind of answers it's giving are still right and that it's not <laughs> the, doing the S bomb is what yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let it, let it drop. drop the S bomb on the show now <laughs> <laughs> had to get it out there drinking game everyone take a shot <laughs> so it's using the ML to uh, to do the work but it's also not just to create the app or the model or, but to also retire it. In the data world, we've been really bad at that. So, in the in the application side, you know, we write the code, we version control it, mm -hmm. and we treat it like a product. We get rid of it when it's not used. In in on the data side, we just create a new data model. So there's a new request. The uh, the DBA or the developers, uh, the 
designer says, sure, I'll create you a new data mart. That data mart sits forever. The machine learning model sits forever. And the, this guy has run off to do All right, so I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. But first, we agree that the data for developers is now upon us. That's going to be figured out. It was the early days. No one yep. has an answer. That's, that's job one. Chat GPT, this yeah. is a question for the, the, the industry analyst who's got all the, the bases covered. What companies are going to be disrupted by Chat GPT? If that goes its course, yeah. name the companies. Is it Snowflake? Is it like Teradata? Who is get disrupted by Chat GPT? I, I, if you I, assume now developers are going to flock to correct. a model where you got data fusion, for lack of a better word, right. or data that's more robust and so, programmable. So John, depending upon who you talk to, you'll find out either ChatGPT produces pristine code or it uh, screws it up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so you get- Just you like a human. <laughs> <laughs> a human. <laughs> so my, my point is that I don't see any company like Snowflake and the database companies getting disrupted at this point. Maybe they'll change, but mm, to me, ChatGPT- I don't GPT, know about that. Yeah, Come on. we don't know. But ChatGPT is an amazing, a way to get started, yeah. but not to finish the job. For that, you still need that expertise. Well, here, well I would, first of all, I think Snowflake would be disrupted because the lock-in point you brought up about WebAssembly is interesting. Now, data can't be locked in. If you lock in data, then you use all the benefits of machine learning. Correct. So you have to assume that. Snowflake's going horizontal across clouds. Yep. But you got to use their fabric. Correct. Right? So you're locked into Snowflake, right? It is true, yeah. So. Does that help or hurt the future of the AI, so, or is it doesn't matter because they can talk to another model? So when, when I first, uh, last year, we had Snowflake Summit and then the Databricks Summit, I'm going to say something which it may be a bit controversial, but when okay, I good. look at what Databricks does, you put all your data in an open format, Apache Parquet files, on an object store with a common interface, maybe it's S3, which is now everybody supports S3. So that data is not locked in. But when you put it in Snowflake, it goes in the proprietary format, plus uh, Snowflake will do micro-partitioning, clustering, anything and everything to improve that speed. So there is a difference, but Snowflake has a massive ecosystem. Yeah. Everybody's moving. Yeah. Every, in fact, I would say cloud data warehouses today have become the clearing house yeah. of all compute activities. There's no doubt, Snowflake is a great yeah. cloud data warehouse. Yeah. And I think, you know, being a cloud data warehouse means you're like managing data at scale, right? Yeah. The question now comes back to the developer. You mentioned Salesforce. Yeah, in the last yeah I, think, I, think the, I think one of the questions is, you know, is the developer going to be programming at Snowflake all the time, or are they going to, or anything, things like a parquet, you know, again, that's part of the, the really exciting parts of the data tool set now, that we're getting all these tools that are designed for, you know, sharing data between applications, easily writing applications against Correct. data, and, and like, these formats are becoming really important for quickly yeah. building new applications Correct. that use data, yeah. and I think that, yeah. um, I, I think it's hard to kind of ignore those things, and that, but you know, you need to get stuff yeah. out of Snowflake because you're going to need it all over the place yeah. in order yeah. to write applications yeah. so that are pervasive, yeah. use so data I, pervasively. Say, people who are watching this are already up in arms because, yeah. because <laughs> they're like, no, wait, how can you say Snowflake is locking in my data because Snowflake can go to external uh, files as a table using Apache Iceberg. Mm -hmm. or hoodie or I'm Delta, already getting hate you know? texts from <laughs> Databricks as well. <laughs> um, since we're brought up Databricks, we'll end with the, the comment around tool chain, because WebAssembly, which we were just on, which I wanted yeah. to bring you in, we couldn't yeah. have enough chairs, yeah. but tying it all together, I think WebAssembly points to the future and it's in its own North Star of, we want to have compatibility around coding and code so that developers don't have to do stuff repetitively right. and yeah. make their job yeah. suckier. Um, and want to make a great experience for developers and be productive. That's <laughs> Unequivocally a great North Star. When you apply it to these tool chains that out there that are proprietary or tied into, say, Databricks tool chain, you're tied into their AI by default on the tool chain. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting to me is, maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a feature, not a bug, if there's a WebAssembly-like mindset in data. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah if, you can, if you can run WebAssembly in, in your Snowflake database, like, 
and things like that. Those are those are definitely options that make it easier to write applications there, portability. And I think that those are the kind of use cases that you know, the security models designed for with WebAssembly yeah. and the extensions for performance yeah. and so on. That, that, that kind of take your code to where the data, your biggest data is. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense from the data gravity point of view. Yeah. Just if, if I can write a highly performant application in C, C++, mm -hmm. compile it to WASM and run it in my database, that is far better than what happens today. Today, yeah. you write it in whatever language you want, then it goes to this translator, it translates it into SQL. Mm -hmm. Because databases, mm -hmm. there's no SQL. Yeah. If I can avoid that and have a binary format, go ahead. I was just, and there's an expense component to that yes. too, right? Because you're pulling the data out of the database, which requires pulling it over the network, right. often yeah. incurring, try, then you're consuming compute resources here, churning through all the data, right. and you're putting it back in. Correct. To be able to run that code inside the database right. instead of out here Correct. means we're saving money, we're yeah. much more efficient, and you can, uh, you yeah. can do more local optimizations around yeah. what, yeah. To, what code actually Dramatically simplifying the tooling and the yep. experience. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, we, we are putting on a clinic here. We've identified that AI <laughs> answer is not yet clear, but we're starting to get signs of visibility into the areas, yep. it's, it's all... Patterns are bubbling up. Yeah, I mean, making yeah. things easier, yeah. faster, reduce the times it takes to do, step, to do yeah. steps. And the database, I mean, maybe it's database-less world we're going to be moving to. Because <laughs> serverless, why well, have so, database-less? So, so what is serverless? <laughs> the way when people say, well, uh, what is serverless? So uh, the way I define it is when you think of serverless, because servers are there, but yeah. you don't think about it. So the database less would be where the end user is not like worried about is it an Oracle or Snowflake or Teradata, but it's there. Well, so we got to end it there. Get we're get, we're it. getting the hook here. Yeah. We're getting, they're going to pull the <laughs> plug on us. They are. Yeah. I'm getting yelled in my ear by Leonard. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much. Sajiv, thanks for coming thank on. Thank you so much. Bringing the analyst yeah. perspective. Yeah. You're laying out the landscape. It's a really the confluence of a really great time. If you're a developer, open source is, is booming. The opportunities just laid out today, some entrepreneurial opportunities, the white space to innovate, tons of action, um, just great stuff. Thanks for sharing. All right, we'll be back more with the live coverage here at KubeCon in Europe. We'll be right back. <laughs>